Our first scripture lesson today comes to us from the book of James, chapter 3, and verses 1 through 12. And our second lesson is a continuation in chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. This is part of our five-part series through the book of James. So let us hear together God's word. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we shall incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they may obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Behold the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot may desire. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree produce, my brethren, olives? Or a vine produce figs? Neither can salt water produce fresh. Here ends the reading of God's first lesson. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is again from the book of James in a continuation, verses 13 through 18 of chapter 3. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Here ends the reading of God's holy word of chapter 3. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The story is told of a young man in the Middle Ages who went to a monk and confessed his sins. He said, I've sinned by telling slanderous statements about someone. What should I do now? The monk replied, Put a feather on every doorstep in town. The young man did it. Then he returned to the monk, wondering if there was something else he should do. The monk said, yes, there is. Now go back and pick up all those feathers. The young man replied, that's impossible. By now, the feathers will have blown all over town, said the monk. So has your slanderous word become impossible to retrieve. James wrote about how a small bit in a horse's mouth can direct the entire animal almost anywhere the rider wants to go. A very small rudder can turn even the largest ships. Our tongues, in the same way, set a course for our lives. It does matter to a great deal what we say. And some words 
we say are impossible to retrieve. But God can forgive us and make it right. An epistle of straw, chapter 3. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word in James. And Lord, this is a tough chapter. And we pray that we might be changed by its truth. That your Holy Spirit might prepare us and teach us. That we might indeed hear the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our hearts and minds. Forgive us, O Lord, even now that we have committed sins of the tongue. We pray in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Verse 1. The importance of being true to the word of God as a teacher or preacher. This verse alone is enough to make any conscientious Christian shake in his or her boots. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. That truth sank into my heart before ever becoming a pastor because I knew that God doesn't ignore someone who leads others astray or away from the truth of the gospel. And it isn't just that a preacher might preach false doctrine, but that even a Sunday school teacher or elder or deacon must not teach false doctrine. No leader in the church is exempt from leading by example and having a true Christian piety. Now, leaders in the church are not held to a higher level of Christian living than other Christians, but they do incur a stricter judgment if they fail to uphold God's laws, his moral and ethical laws. Not that a teacher or preacher must be perfect. If that were the case, no one could serve in those roles but that we must be practicing daily the Christian life and on a daily basis living by Christ's word and the Holy Spirit and live as Christ intends for us to live, being led by the word of God. So James suggests that not many of us should become teachers because we will incur a stricter judgment if we are unfaithful. Friends, it's not easy to be a Sunday school teacher or preacher or anyone who spreads the message of Christ. All teachers, all preachers who no longer teach the word of God and have decided that they don't need to or even live and uphold the truths of our Lord and Savior shall ultimately have to stand before God and answer for it. Therefore, it is a great honor, a great privilege to be a leader in the church, but it is also a tremendous responsibility. Let us not take our teaching roles lightly because God doesn't. It is my personal prayer to never cause anyone to stumble in their walk with Jesus or to never lead anyone away from God's holy word and the gospel. And I pray that Christian leaders everywhere will heed James warning, verses 2 through 12, the taming of the tongue. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. I had an uncle who had developed a very bad habit of cussing as a young man, and he never gave up that habit as he got older. It only, in fact, grew worse. He would cuss left and right in every sentence. And when I was a boy, my father took me to meet my uncle, and I was shocked at all the words that came from his mouth. He didn't use them for effect or because he was angry, but he just used them as part of his everyday communication. And when my father saw my shocked reaction for the first time to those words, he was concerned with how I was handling it. But my mother immediately pulled me aside and told me that that is not the way to speak ever, ever, ever. And why was she so concerned? Because she knew that it could become a habit like it did for him. We know that all of us stumble in various ways. 
But by far the most difficult habits to break are the sins of the tongue. The tongue can be filled with restless evil and deadly poison, James says. Yet it can also be filled with beautiful praises to God. It can edify and bless our brothers and sisters. It can deliver love and the good news of the gospel to the lost. And yet the tongue can also be vulgar and vicious, even as the fires of hell. The Bible says that our tongue can defile us and make us unfit in our service to God. One day, the prophet Isaiah was in the temple of God and he suddenly saw a vision of the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, and the train of his robe came down and wrapped around the inside of the temple. He was surrounded by the holiness of God. And he saw seraphim, which are fiery winged angel-like creatures, and they were calling out to each other in the temple, and they spoke and worshiped God, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The ground beneath Isaiah's feet began shaking. He felt the foundation of the temple crumbling beneath him, and the temple began to fill with smoke. He was in the midst of the holy presence of God and in the conviction of those fear-filled moments, he cried out, Woe to me! I am ruined! For I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew towards him with a burning coal which was taken from the altar of sacrifice. And the creature touched his mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. This man was defiled by his wagging tongue, and God had to first cleanse Isaiah before God would use him. Think of it. One of the greatest prophets Israel ever knew had to first tighten his tongue. Jesus also taught of how the tongue can defile a person in Matthew 15, 10 through 11. And after he called the multitude to him, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what enters into the mouth defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. James tells us that our tongue will determine for the greatest part which course we take in life. James used the analogy of a large ship for whichever way a very small rudder turns on that large ship, that is the way it will go. Likewise, a horse is trained to go in the direction the bit is pulled. The course of our lives, friends, may be driven by God's power and by many things that we don't understand. But our tongue can change our destination. The tongue can not only change the destination of our individual lives, it can change a whole family, a church, a community, a nation. Such is the phenomenal power of words. They will either steer you towards a safe shore and the Lord and his glory, or towards a giant storm and a rogue wave will change your life forever. Yes, it is our words that will determine our final destination. Jesus said that all those who will confess him with their mouths, with their tongues before others, he will confess before the Father in heaven. Likewise, whoever will deny Christ before others, he will deny that person before the Father who is in heaven. It is the tongue which either denies its creator or receives his salvation. In a way, the tongue becomes the door to heaven or the door to the gates of hell. James also says the tongue is like a flame. Even a small flame can set afire an entire forest of trees, especially trees that are already 
dead and dry. And so too, rumors can spread into a whole church, consume all those who hear them. As Proverbs 16, 28 declares, a perverse man spreads strife and a slanderer separates intimate friends. The fire which spreads from rumor can separate family and even people who have been friends for years. It can be as devastating as fire, burning everything in its wake. We can ask for forgiveness like Isaiah did, but the damage may have already been done. And Jesus explained to the religious leaders of his day that words reveal our very character in Matthew 12, 34 through 35. The mouth speaks, he said, of that which fills the heart. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of his treasure brings forth what is evil. And when Jesus spoke, Luke 4.22 indicates, and all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. You see, the secret to taming the tongue is first to admit that we cannot do it ourselves. It is plain human nature to talk and to fill in the blanks when we don't know. James is right when he insists. No one is able to tame our tongue. But remember this, the tongue is also a mirror of what is in our hearts. If we are frustrated or angry or jealous or cruel, then we'll find ways of expressing that with our words. The mouth speaks only of that which fills the heart. And therefore, if our hearts are filled with God's word and the love of Jesus Christ and the love of his people and many prayers, then that is what will come out of us. The more we spend in God's word and in prayer and around God's people, the more the Lord's voice will spill graciously out of our lips. James put it this way, from the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Or as the country preacher once said, a honeybee can't sting and make honey at the same time. Isaiah experienced the holiness and righteousness of God through a vision, but there will come a day, my friends, when we will all experience exactly the same conviction before the throne of God in his kingdom, at the judgment seat of Christ. And those of us who have received the hot coal of the atonement sacrifice of Jesus Christ shall be forgiven. But anyone who has rejected Christ and still has unclean lips shall have to give an account of every useless word he or she has ever uttered in that moment. Jesus said, and I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Verses 13 through 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. When Christians in a church do some good deed or help someone, another Christian can become jealous of that recognition. Pastors do it all the time. This can happen between staff members in a church or between members in a congregation. There can develop a, a natural human competition for recognition. And Satan can use that uh, desire in our hearts for recognition and jealousies to tear up a ministerial staff team or even a whole church. Many Presbyterians have a rule that, that an associate pastor of any particular church cannot become the senior pastor of that same church. And why do they have that rule? It is so that these natural ambitions don't become a temptation for any associate 
to undermine the ministry of the senior pastor only to attempt to take his place. Unfortunately, pastors are susceptible to ambitions and self-gratifying goals, the same as anyone else, but they should never give in to them. Every pastor should be seeking instead the wisdom that comes from above. I don't want to have a reactionary ministry that merely tries to keep up with the church down the street or the pastor under some big church steeple. And I pray that our people never try to outdo one another in their Christian walk only for the purpose of recognition. Let us all become Christians of divine wisdom who serve the Lord because we love him. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder in every evil thing, he writes. For that kind of natural worldly wisdom is not from above, but is actually demonic. But the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy, without any acting. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who do make peace. I pray that I will never have to stand before God and say, woe is me, for I am ruined. I don't want to be guilty of having unclean lips, and it is a joy to me to be a part of a church and a denomination that supports the preaching and the teaching of the truths of God's word. I never want to be dragged before any church or presbytery committee again and have to defend the plain teaching of the gospel. And so let us allow our hearts to be filled with the truth of the Holy Spirit who reveals the word of God and the love of Christ. Let us fill our hearts with good things and we will speak of good things. Even our words can be a blessing to our neighbors. From our mouths come both blessings and cursings. Brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be this way. Let us ask God to cleanse our lips with burning hot coals from his spirit and his word that we might be fit and called and blessed by the master for his good use. To God be all the praise and glory. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we know that the easiest sins to commit are those of the tongue. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Touch us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with those things which are good and acceptable and right in your sight. Lord, fill us with only lovely things from your kingdom that we might share them with others and the good news of Jesus Christ May our tongues be used to further the gospel and obey the great commission. And may we not become jealous of anyone, O Lord, in his or her service to you. But seek out you alone in our lives because we love you, because you first loved us. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.